My name is Virginia Woodward and I'm our service leader for this morning and it's so great that I see just about all the tables filled. So good to be together to praise and honour and worship our God. Today we welcome our Bishop Peter Haywood who's come to be with us and we look forward to hearing from him a little later in the service. Let's begin with a psalm. Psalm 121. And this is one of my favourite psalms. I love it because for us living here under the escarpment, it really puts us in the place where this psalm begins. And when we read it together responsively, I'm going to read the odd verses and you'll respond in the even ones. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. And amen. And what a segue. Our first song, if you will stand as the musicians come, is Forever. His love endures forever. Thank you, musicians. What a great way to start our service. We are the people of God, but scripture reminds us that we still sin. We need to confess our failures, knowing that the Lord Jesus intercedes for us with the Father, who freely forgives us through his infinite goodness and mercy. So let us draw near to God with sincerity and confidence and pray together. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins 
and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you as we should and serve you as we ought. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace that we may continue to grow as members of Christ in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. And scripture reminds us, firstly from Exodus, that God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Saviour and Lord. And in Romans we're reminded there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Before the children leave, I'd like them to stand where they are before they go to their program, and I'm going to pray for them. So these are our wonderful children who are about to go to Kingdom Kids and Thrive. Let's pray for them. Father God, we thank you for these, our children, your children. We pray that as they go to their program this morning, Lord, that they will learn more of you and that their hearts will be opened to hear and to respond. Lord, just help them to grow each week as they learn more and more about you. Please be with their leaders as they encourage the children, lead the children and teach the children. And Father, we ask that today they have lots of fun together. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So kids, off you go to your programs. Have a great time learning more about God. And as they leave, I invite John to come up this morning for our focus spot, bringing with him Bishop Peter. Thank you, John and Peter. Well, um, today it's uh, our privilege and pleasure to have Peter with us, uh, Bishop Peter. Can you start, Peter, though, by telling us um, the rude way to say it is, how did you get to be a bishop? No. Um, <laughs> no. What, what, what is a bishop's job and, and what's your sort of area and, and uh, role? Having been in this role for a while, I realised one of the bishop's job is to go around from church to church telling people what does a bishop do. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Um, So what a bishop does, it's the same responsibility as any minister of a church except my area that I have sort of oversight of is much bigger. It's sort of looking over a region and part of that is to make sure our churches are operating well, Uh, we're taking advantage of opportunities, dealing with issues that might arise and basically under God trying to see how the gospel can progress over a wider area by cooperatively working with all our churches in a way that they're flourishing and under God, um, moving to develop people as disciples of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And how big's the area that you cover? Uh, It's a little bit different than it used to be. So until last year, I also include most of Campbelltown, MacArthur, but currently it's the Southern Shire down to Ulladulla, Southern Highlands and the Wollongong uh, area, including Picton, and uh, Wallandilly areas. Some of those, Picton you mentioned, some of those areas have been flood bound recently. Yep. Um, what's been going on there with churches and, and uh, relief work and so on? Uh, most of the churches in our region have been okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, Picton Church uh, had to sandbag their church three times. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, they had a major we, about we, six... We, we have to sandbag to keep people in. You yeah, see, that's, that's right. right. We can... <laughs> You can arrive, but you would never leave. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so Picton Church, if you know, in Picton, it's in a floodplain. It had a very major uh, flood there about six years ago, and uh, there was concern there was going to be floods, so they sandbagged the area. Uh, then they thought the flood uh, thing left. They removed it, and they had to put the sandbags back again. Fortunately, the rain didn't come up. But apart from that, most of our other churches just had water leakages and stuff mm-hmm. like that, but that's the only church that really had a significant issue. Uh, here's a surprising thing about our Anglican churches. If you go to a small town, where will you find normally the Anglican church in that small town? At the lowest point or the highest point of the town? The highest point. <laughs> if you go to St Michael's, why is St Michael's Wollongong right at the top of the hill? That's where you, you know, that's where typically so most of our churches, except for Picton, are in locations where they haven't been affected. Thank you. Yep. Um, All of your area, and in fact the whole world, has been affected by COVID problems. Um, Any stories of COVID? Well, how are churches managing it with COVID, or have been over the last two years? It's been a very difficult period of time, um, having to deal with all the uh, unexpected requirements of going online and 
where our technology suddenly improved enormously as we went online. Mm. Uh, we sort of managed that period. Coming back, uh, most churches were seeing a sort of a small little de decline. The group that perhaps have been slowest to come back are families. Mm -hmm. Not overwhelmingly everywhere, but that would be sort of a general thing. And I think the other thing, we've come back a little bit sort of like, oh, we're here. There's, so, there's not the same energy enthusiasm. So a lot of our ministers have come through the two-year period and just started the year a bit flat because it's been a difficult uh, period of time and some of our folk themselves just sort of feeling a little bit flat. So as we begin the year, we're praying for God's mercy upon us that he would enthuse us and energize us afresh because we do it just to acknowledge there's been a bit of a toll on all of us as a consequence of that so <clears throat> i think the next step will be what are the other learnings um, have come to us after the COVID period and i think that's still a moment of reflection i've got some thoughts but that's for later on so what's the long-term consequences of all that how do we think about things uh, will be something that we'll need to attend to. But on the whole, our churches have come through pretty well. I say that by comparison to some churches in America where it's been really a lot more difficult. But in Australia, in our context, God's been very kind. Mm -hmm. Now, in your area, some there are some sort of growth areas and growth works <laughs> going on around Wilton and so on, around all yep. those areas and, and more than that. Um, what sort of opportunities are there for churches in your area now, what sort of uh, gospel opportunities and what should we be thinking and picking yeah. up on? So uh, John just mentioned Wilton at the corner of Picton Road and Hume Highway. They're building a town there eventually called mm -hmm. Wilton Junction, mm -hmm. just a small little town of 50 or 60,000 people. <laughs> it's a, ultimately be bigger than Goulburn mm -hmm. uh, and we've got a minister there. That development's already underway if you've been up the way. And we've got some work already uh, commencing with the demountable, but we're looking for to acquire some land to build a church there in the town centre eventually. That's one example. The other things across our area, we realise that if we want to reach every community, there's a complexity about the, how our communities now operate. And so if I use the Lake Illawarra foreshore area, we've just realised there's sort of a whole foreshore from sort of Berkeley all the way around to Albion Park Rail, mm -hmm. we sort of haven't really got them worked out well. So just mm -hmm. working out, so I actually got a meeting this week about how we can work out ministry in those sort of contexts mm -hmm. a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Well, you're going to speak to us about, what are you going to, speak? can you give us just a, a two sentence summary of what you're going to say in your sermon today? Well, I could. <laughs> All right, I'll change will, my question. I'll, 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 I'll change I'll, I'll, my question. I'll do, no, I'll do that. Will Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> Thank you, John, for inviting me to be here. Uh, does, God, does God care about suffering? And I want to say the best way to understand does God care about suffering is looking at the fact that Jesus suffered. And if Jesus suffered, what does that mean about God's caring of us? So teasing that out. Thank you. Right okay. Let me pray for you before you go. Heavenly Father, thank you for the way that you are building your church and we thank you that Peter has been part of that and is part of that. We pray that you will bless him as bishop, give him wisdom, give him insight, give him compassion, give him energy for the work that you have for him to do and we pray that together we might be partners with you Lord in building your church in this in this region for Jesus sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks Peter. Thanks John. Thank you for that, Peter and John. It's really good to get some understanding, isn't it, of just what a bishop does and what a huge area. I think uh, that will help us understand how large, um, how large Peter's job is and remind us that we should be praying for him. So I think that's great to have him here with us this morning. I invite uh, our musos back again because we're now going to sing our next song, Before the Throne of God Above. So would you like to stand as they come and prepare to sing?
we're about to hear from God's word, so let me pray. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us, showing us the way of salvation in your Son. We ask you now to teach us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hi, my name's Alison and I'm going to be doing the readings for you today. Uh, the first reading comes from Jeremiah 33, verses 10 to 18. Uh, this comes from Jeremiah, is imprisoned for the second time in the king's palace. Thus says the Lord, In this place of which you say, It is a waste without men or beast, in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man or inhabitant or beast, there shall be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thank offerings to the house of the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as at first, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In this place that is waste, without man or beast, and in all of its cities, there shall again be habitations of shepherds resting their flocks. In the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the Shephelah, and in the cities of the Negeb, in the land of Benjamin, in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, Flocks shall again pass under the hands of the one who counts them, says the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall ex execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. The second reading comes from Hebrews chapter 4. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honour for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. 
being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. I now invite uh, Bishop Peter to come and speak to us. We're really looking forward to hearing from you, Peter. Thank you. So I believe you're going through a series about I believe and uh, my topic that is assigned to me by John is God cares in a suffering world. God cares in a suffering world. Now I don't need to demonstrate that we live in a suffering world. You know it. You have uh, uh, maybe even uh, either you've seen it or it's actually impacted you directly. Uh, you know it's reality. You know that we live in a world that does have suffering embedded in it. Uh, the suffering, I guess, that we find hardest to understand is what we might call innocent suffering. So when we hear the terrible stories of what's happening in Ukraine, the one that hits us most are the kids who are just these innocent bystanders and this being affected and killed, and that really cuts us deeply. Um, <clears throat> but the question behind the one about does God care about suffering is that if we believe in a God who's both sovereign and good, and we do... How does the reality of suffering intersect with God, who is powerful and good, yet live in a world where there's terrible things occurring? Um, and, and behind that is the acute nature of the title, does God care about it? Does God care about the reality of your suffering, my suffering and the world's suffering? And so it's not a philosophical question, though it's often framed that way and there's books that deal with these matters in all sorts of very important ways that I don't want to dismiss. But for most people, it's a personal question. And I want to use a passage from Hebrews 4, the second one that returned to us, Hebrews 4, 14 to 5, 10, to try and unpack this at least a little bit. Obviously, it will be not complete in its uh, way we're looking at it, but at least to give us some sense of it. And the two verses I want to just start on is verse 7 and 8 of chapter 5, <clears throat> where we read, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learnt obedience from what he suffered. He learnt obedience from what he suffered. So two things just to notice about that little two verses. One, he cried out to God with tears. He cried out to God that he would remove what he had to go through. He cried out to God to save him from suffering and death in the world. Yet God heard his prayers and he suffered and he died. Two, he was God's own beloved son, the son he loved. Yet this son he loved suffered and died, and from that he learned obedience. So they're the things we land upon with Jesus. As I said at the beginning, if you want to understand suffering in the world, we've got to land upon and understand Jesus. The most important thing we need to hear is this, Jesus suffered. He suffered personally and for others and for us. Now put that aside, that's just the introduction. I would assume there's not one person wandering around Kiraville, if I can pick on a suburb of Wollongong, and that's where we are, who are having a conversation with someone else around them about the possibility of having some sort of direct access to God. If I, you know, the idea they're sort of wondering, you know, if I call out to God, will he hear me? If I try to have access to God, would I possibly ever get close to him? We don't have those sorts of conversations uh, at all. It's not part of our way that we think about generally life in the world. Uh, the possibility that, could, how could it, you know, if you think about it, how could anyone approach the true and living God, the God who lives in unapproachable light? How could anyone just have access to him? Now, it's not just that we don't think along these lines. Uh, you might remember Martin Luther was sort of in his conscience really beaten down by the idea, how can I, a sinner, have access to God? That was really behind a lot of the things that he was dealing with in the start of the Reformation. But also I think it's because we've got the hangover of our Christian era. We just assume that if we need to, 
I can just call out to God anytime, anywhere. If I've got a problem, I can just say, God, help me out. And of course, I've got direct access to him and he will hear me. And it's just a given. Before Jesus came into the world, going back to the Old Testament, the idea of having direct access to God was an impossibility in most Israelites' eyes. If you know the system they had, they had a high priest and they had a temple. And once a year, the high priest, after going through a whole heap of different systems, uh, things on the Day of Atonement, went into the Holy of Holies, the centre point of the whole temple. So the temple, think of how different sort of things, onion sort of coming you cut to the very centre and you have this place called the Holy of Holies uh, and it was just a big room hidden behind a, a curtain, you remember the story of the curtain being torn in two, that big place and that represented the most inner sanctum and this is a place that you have direct access to God but to get to that point a high priest once a year after sacrificing for his own sin sacrifice, he could finally get to that point where he have direct access to God and have a sense of being really close to God. Um, he had to do all these rituals to deal with his own sin and the sin of the nation. And the high priest had the role of representing God, other people to God. So the whole Old Testament sacrificial system that we read through and reminded as we go through our Old Testament readings was to say access to God is extraordinary it's not just a natural thing when we have Jesus we have access but before that it's not straightforward at all and so for the author of Hebrews we need to understand Jesus in these categories to know how extraordinarily blessed we are that in Jesus the Christ we can actually have access to him and this really makes a big difference in our understanding of the nature of suffering in the world as we get to it. The more we understand what privilege we have with Jesus, the Son of God who is the high priest we need, the more that is grasped, the more that we have the capacity to understand how we can uh, understand his care of our suffering. Do you notice how it starts in verse 14 of chapter 4 you have that there in front of you and my bible reading it says uh, my bible says therefore since we have a great high priest who has ascended to the heavens jesus son of god let us hold firmly to the faith we profess notice we have jesus said i'll remind you jesus was the high priest and he did that something he did no we have in the present and continue to have into the future, a high priest assigned to us. And so the question, or the Hebrews will say, and we don't ask this question, an important question, who is your high priest? And we would say, well, we have a high priest. Jesus is a high priest. Now, we need to dig a big... Dig. I'm going to get to the question of suffering, but this is all background. We need to dig a little bit deeper this whole question of the high priest and Jesus. Remember uh, in the Old Testament there were kings and the first king was, this is a little quiz, who was the first king? Saul, very good. And there were priests. And one of the things in the Old Testament was very important that kings represented God to the people and priests represented the people to God. So kings represented God to the people, priests represented people to God. The kings provided authority over the people and priests provided solidarity for the people with God and so yet both were needed. Now it's not just that, it was also very important and very clear in the Old Testament that no one could be both priest and king. You say why? They were separated out because the role of representing yourself to God or God representing yourself to the people were two different activities. Now, if, if you remember, we talked about King Saul. Remember his um, first kingship fall fell apart? Did last. God said he rejected him. One of the reasons he rejected him, because he took it upon himself to offer sacrifices when as king, that was not his prerogative. 
He stays out of that whole sacrificial world. That's for the role of the priest. So he tried to take the role upon himself and bring the two officers together. There's only one exception to this pattern, Old Testament, and that was a man called Melchizedek, which this passage talks about. He was a king of Salem, but also offered priests, uh, offered sacrifices to God. He was both a king and priest. And the significance of that is what is Jesus, we're told in this passage? He's a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. He was designated in verse 10 by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. That is, and here we get to the big point, Jesus, by being that, has finally allowed these two things to come together. He is both the great king of the world and the high priest the world needs. He is both king and priest. Now that's an extraordinary thing. He is, and we are used to this saying, he's Lord of Lords, King of Kings. We sing that, don't we? The great king above all the earth. He has sovereignty over everyone and everything. His rule is absolute. And he came to defeat the enemies. And he came to secure a future where all the enemies are defeated. He's come to bring a future that we are guaranteed will be better than anything we have now. That's the thing called heaven. Do you look forward to heaven? No tears, crying, mourning, sadness. And he secured that by his death resolutely and defiantly and he will get and guarantee as king of kings he will get us to the end now left there it is a bit like we hear sometimes the pie in the sky when you die ever hear that okay here we are it'll get better hang in there you'll be out right at the end it was just king of kings and that's all he ever was but he's not is he he is king but also priests. And as priests, he does something else for us. He is the one who allows us to understand his continued care of us all the way through to the end. Uh, in 4.15, as high priest, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin in 5 2 of jesus as high priest he's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he himself is subject to weakness jesus not just king and we're used to the language of lordship and kingship what i'm landing on here he's also the high priest we don't talk about this way very much but it's very vital we get the idea that we have a high priest in Jesus who actually cares with us, empathises us, sympathises with us. He was appointed to this role by God because he is God's son. You are my son today, I become your father. As a son, his ancestry is bound not in anything in this world, but with God himself. You've seen all those TV programs where people trace their ancestry and all you look back at the, you know, did I have come from convict stock? You know, who were the great things in my past? And it connects us to a story of things that are surprising in our family life. Well, Jesus' life was connected to God himself. And his ancestry is granted in God himself. And as high priest, he's been appointed the eternal high priest not just for a moment in time, but forever. And we come to the same significance of the verses I started with. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became a source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. So again, as Saviour King, the Saviour and Lord of Lord, he rules the world and rules our life and confronts our enemies and promises an end where everything is secure and right. Justice is served, no more suffering. He will get us there. We can rely upon him. What he started, he'll bring to an end. 
But as we go through, he's also our high priest. And he continues to be the person who draws close to us all the way through. He is both king and high priest, and both are needed to understand how God deals and cares about suffering. If only he had authority as king, he'd be unapproachable. Some people have only this picture of God. God is severe and remote, hard to have access to. He has promises that we grab hold of, but basically we just all on our own to get through. That is not the picture of the Bible. Because the Bible says Jesus is also our high priest. He draws close to us. He draws close to you. He sympathises with your circumstances. He understands your weaknesses. He will ultimately right wrongs, but you're not alone as you go through. Now, why is that? What was Jesus' life like? He experienced the normal disappointments of life. He had various hurts and losses, confusions and perplexities of life. He intimately knew the the reality of suffering. He suffered deeply in his death. Oh yes, you might say, he did not have to deal with the complexities of living in an internet age and social media and things like that. He did not have to trust his heavenly father with his retirement plans that all went south and one fell swoop when everything just fell apart. He didn't have to deal with the relational complexities of families that often seem like they're pressing down and hard to deal with. He didn't have to go through the ravages of getting older. He didn't have to deal with the ravages of suddenly ill health, health and things like that. But he knows better than you and I, he really knows the intellectual and moral weaknesses that we live with when we fail to live up to God's will. He's felt acutely in his life what it's like to live with the sin all around him, though he did not sin. And that's why his prayers were heartfelt, asking God, if it is your will to take this cup from me. But God responded in silence. So he even knows what it's like when we pray earnestly for things and they're not given straight away. He knows the full depth of temptation to give up on God, to walk away and say, it's too hard, it's not worth it, stop trusting. And we read, he was tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. So how do we respond to all that? Well, two sections of this thing that helps us understand. Again, 4.14. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses. He empathises with your weaknesses. Uh, uh, Unless you tell me you have none, and then please let's have some time where we can talk about that. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Just as we are, yet he did not sin. Christ is in heaven, but he remains open always with tenderness and willingness to embrace us as fallen weak people who are dealing with things in this world that are beyond our capacity to understand. He won't leave you alone. He's your high priest. He represents you to God. And the burden of Jesus in his life now and his mediatorial work as high priest is to show solidarity with us as his people. He doesn't just say, oh, well, I'll deal with them when everything's going well. But especially he wants to deal with us and our weaknesses. There's no cool detachment from Jesus saying, oh well, I really hope they get through. I really hope they make it. It pains him. I use the language, it pains him. He empathises with us in our walk. He draws close to us in our walk. We don't realise how significant that is, but I'm telling you that is the reality of your existence if you're a follower of Jesus. 
He can't hold him back. He never says, oh, I've had enough. I've <laughs> really, I've, had enough. I've dealt with that Peter guy for long enough. I'm really over it. Had enough. Never reached that point. Never reached that point. Because he journeyed in our world as we do. He's endured our world where he had loneliness. Friends leave him, abandon him. He knew what it like to be suffering, tortured, killed innocently, but without sin. And indeed, because he was sinless, he felt it more acutely than I ever felt it, or you will ever feel it. So when the circumstances of life come crashing down and we feel like we're suffering in ways that are beyond our capacity and we feel isolated, I want to say again, in Jesus you're never alone. You are not alone. You have a high priest who draws close and empathises tenderly and compassionately with our circumstances. The instinctive heartbeat of our high priest is to give us help and relieve us, not distance himself from us, but to draw close to us. Then 5.2. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself as is subject to weakness. He knows the reality of weakness in our world. Again, but he did not sin. And he deals gently with us, calmly, tenderly, Gently, he can deal with all sinners who are ignorant and wayward. He never deals with someone and says, well, I don't know how you got to this situation, but I'm sorry, this one's beyond me. I don't know how you got here, but boy, oh boy, where you've landed, that's beyond my capacity. Never occur. Will not be the case. In fact, the severity of our sin that causes us is ultimately irrelevant to him because all he wants us to do is turn to him. And he will never receive a scowl or a scold. You say, I told you so. Only if you listen to me. He never has frustration or fatigue. He sees our sin for what it is. He sees our circumstance of what they are. He sees our suffering in all its depth. And he meets us with grace. He meets us with mercy. And he meets us with tenderness. Does God care about our sin? Yes, we have a high priest that shows us the case. So therefore, don't lose your confession. That's where the section started. Let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. This is your high priest. You can approach God with confidence. You can come to God with certainty in Jesus and realise that you will receive that warm embrace. Does it change everything straight away? Not necessarily. Are we confident at the end we'll get there because he's also the king who guarantees a final outcome? Absolutely. But he'll be with us all the way through. And therefore... In 4.16, let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. I love that uh, phrase, throne of grace. Remember the iron throne from Game of Thrones? Thrones are harsh, hard, powerful, strong. What's the throne like here? Grace. Isn't that a wonderful image? We do not meet the wagging finger of God whenever we turn to him. (laughs) He never says, how many times have I had to deal with you? No, he reaches, reaches us as we are and takes hold of us. Never not you again. Oh, I'm so glad I can embrace you and be with you. So does God care about us in a suffering world? Absolutely. You have a high priest who shows that to be the case. Take hold of him as your high priest and find in him the tenderness, the kindness, the gentleness, 
and mercy and take hold of his throne of grace or keep it going all the way to the end he promises that are secured by him as king of kings and lord of lords who will sustain us all the way through eternity. Amen. And thank you, Peter, for that sermon. God does care for us in this suffering world. Good morning, church. And good morning, Peter. It's great to have you here today. It really is. Let's pray. Father, firstly, we praise and worship your name. Father God, Elohim, I am the Eternal One, the Most High. Your name is mighty and is above all other powers and entities across this universe and across this our earth. Thank you for staying so firm in your never-ending love for us, a people who so often look away from you. Your love is beyond our understanding. It holds this world together. It holds us together. It holds the very breath we breathe together to give us life. Thank you for your great love for each of us here today. Thank you, Lord. Father, the world is groaning and seemingly hit from all sides, from violent military and religious-based aggression affecting so many lives across all the continents, the continuing droughts in many lands, the destructive floods through Europe, Asia and here, and of course the worldwide COVID pandemic spreading in most of our lives. All, our cause, all are causing great suffering and fear to people. Father, we bring this attack on our world by Satan to you, to the foot of your throne, and ask that your hand of peace to replace the hatred and destruction we have seen Satan unleash. unleash. We hear of the great fear spreading across the European nations as they see the build-up of NATO's forces in reaction to the Russia's violence against innocent people. Please, we ask that your hand fall on the leaders of this conflict who are responsible for, for such evil deeds and that the plea from the Ukrainian president, Mr Zelensky, for people across the world to pray for peace for their nation be heard and be answered. You tell us to pray in faith. Please let our prayers be answered. We ask that in this hour of suffering, your grace is seen and your peace and freedom is restored in, your, in the Ukraine and to its people. And let this draw them and others closer to you. We ask that the aggressors be removed from their seats of power, be accountable for their evil actions, and that they are replaced by leaders who stop the suffering and care for their nations and for their neighbours. You tell us, Blessed are the peacemakers. Please bless them. We pray too for the many people who have been, who have seen their homes and businesses destroyed by the heavy rains and damaging floods which have hit Eastern Australia in these last few weeks. Please comfort those who have lost loved ones and be with the communities as they endeavour to rebuild their lives. We ask that both the government and all the relevant bodies, including the churches, work together to help the people rebuild their lives and their communities. Especially help and guide our churches to show your love to these people and in so doing bring them closer to you. Please help them work together as one for you. Lord, now that the Northern Territory is opening from the COVID restrictions and the weather is clearing with roads now opened, Please help all those who are working on standing the 20 metre cross in the centre of Australia. We ask for the team to be quickly reassembled for a quick completion with no more stoppages. Please place your angels around the site and your Holy Spirit over the workers, keeping them safe and healthy as they complete the project. Thank you for the Aboriginal brothers who have asked to be part of the team and let them all feel your presence in this task. Thank you for using this symbol of your love for mankind to release not only the, the indigenous nations, but our nation as a whole. Bring us together 
forgiving each other for the past and joining together under you for our nation's future. Lord Jesus, as we stand, oh, as we stand with Lisa, Brendan, Grace and Ben at this time in the loss of Lisa's mum, Edith, we know that her dad Ian is in deep shock and we ask that your Holy Spirit comfort and support him. We also ask your hand of love to surround Megan Ryman as, and her sister-in-law as they mourn the loss of Megan's brother-in-law, Paul. Please especially be with Paul's wife and family as they struggle through this time and through this pain. And through this pain, let them seek and find you. We thank you too that Helen Cox has come home from hospital and that sh she will now have time to recover with no further problems. Thank you, Lord, for her great love and depth of faith in you. Lord God, and you, St John's Hall site, has been a bit damp underfoot since construction work began, especially these last four weeks. We ask that we can have a dry spell at the site for the next two weeks so that the groundwater can drop and the waterlogged holes dry out, ready for the concrete to be poured into the excavated footing trenches. Father, lastly, we thank you so much for the news of the coming appointment of our new minister, Reverend Peter Hutchinson and his wife Anna, who will join us to lead this church of yours at Kiraville. Again, thank you for the tireless efforts of the team of nominators. We spent the many hours and late nights searching for, reviewing and then interviewing the many applicants. We thank you for your chosen minister to lead your work here. We have had our prayers answered and are truly blessed. Father, we know your Holy Spirit is leading us through this time in history and that we are not alone. Thank you that you have sent your spirit to guide and re to teach us. We love you, Lord. You are our Father. Amen. Now we're going to come together and say the Lord's Prayer together. Let's say it slowly so the words and the meaning really sinks in. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. If our musicians would like to come again to lead us in this now, our final song for the morning. No, not one. Thank you, musicians.
So our closing blessing now. To God the Father who loved us and made us acceptable in the Beloved. To God the Son who loved us and loosed us from our sins by his own blood. To God the Holy Spirit who spreads the love of God abroad in our hearts. To the one true God be all love and all glory for time and for eternity. Amen.